Well, good morning, church. How's it going? Everybody enjoy their Thanksgiving? Everybody fat and happy? Hope so. Um, I don't know about you guys, but the holidays really snuck up on me this year. I am, um, some of you may know this about me, but I am an avid uh, Black Friday shopper. And I did go this year, but I was a little unprepared, didn't get all my Christmas shopping done like I normally do, so that was a bit of a bummer for myself. But nonetheless, I hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving and some good time with family and friends. Um, and thank you guys so much for being here. You know, today we are kicking off our Advent series. And if you're not familiar with what Advent is, it's the season observed by Christians around the globe during the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And during this time, we're focused on prayer and anticipation of Christ's arrival, the coming kingdom. Christ's first coming inaugurates God's kingdom, and it is a full, but its full realization is yet to come. And so during Advent, we reflect on both the already present kingdom and the not yet aspects of God's kingdom through the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. And today we're going to start off by talking about hope, and specifically hope in Emmanuel, God with us. You know, the holidays can be some of the most lonely times of the year. I don't know what holiday season brings for you and your loved ones, but it's a time when everyone seems to be happy. In fact, there's a song telling us that it should in fact be the hap happiest time of the year. But that's not always the reality for all of us. And statistics actually show that many so, uh, have this time as the loneliest time of the year for themselves. According to National Alliance for Mental Health, 66% of individuals report feeling lonely during the holidays. And this is for various reasons. Some report this for financial strain, societal pressure, grief, many other things. There's so much pressure to put on an act to be, in fact, the happiest person at the happiest time of year, to give the best gifts, throw the best parties, to show your family, who you might not see that often, that you're intact, that you are put together, life is going well, whatever facade you need to do to get through the season. And the solution that the National Alliance for uh, Mental Health poses to combat the holiday blues is actually to just be patient and manage your expectations. Manage your expectations of yourself and manage those of the people around you. And while this offers some resolve, I argue that the gospel has a better invitation for us. The gospel invites us more than to just temper our expectations, but to actually enter a season of anticipation or hope in Christ. And let's be honest, the word anticipation does come with it, expectations. And the gospel tells us we can actually have some expectations for this holiday season, for Christmas. And those expectations are found in our perfect Savior. Some of those expectations include the promise of God, Emmanuel, God with us. The hope that we have found in that promise. And the second promise that we have is the gospel or the good news of Christ's birth that promises a never-ending kingdom, an ever-present Savior in both the already, now, and the not yet. And we see both of these promises in today's passage. Luke 1, 26 through 33 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Two promises. The Lord is with you, and the kingdom will have 
no end. These two promises that are embedded in Luke's story of the announcement of the birth of Jesus, these promises also actually answer Old Testament prophecy and promises of what the Messiah and the Messianic deliverance for Israel would be. So in order to understand these promises a little better, we're going to remind ourselves, do a little history lesson, of what the Israel's, uh, Israelites' understanding of the kingdom of God and the Messiah was. So we go back to the Old Testament, the historic books, okay? In the Old Testament, the kingdom of God was experienced in real, tangible ways through the lives of the Israelites through earthly Usually these were from the Davidic line, okay, the line of David, where we see um, them as God's appointed rulers. They bring about qualities, divine qualities like justice and righteousness to earth. And their reign, though imperfect, was in fact seen as a manifestation of God's heavenly reign on earth, providing deliverance and redemption to the people of God in Israel. Then we move in the Old Testament to the prophets. And the prophets of the Old Testament speak of a future comprehensive reign of the kingdom of God over all nations, not just the nation of Israel. And while God's authority extended beyond Israel even in Old Testament times, the full realization of his universal reign was still to come and still is. Prophetic vision, like those of Daniel, pointed to a future time when a messianic figure, the Son of Man, would establish an everlasting kingdom, characterized by peace and justice and the defeat of evil. So in sum, Israel expected salvation to come in the form of an earthly king who was full of justice and righteousness. However, the Gospels tell us that the Savior, our salvation, actually came in the form of a baby, born to a faithful servant from a small town that no one expected much out of. Christ is the Savior that we need, not the one that we expected. This physical Jesus revealed to his mother and father as fully human and fully divine, had to actually reveal to the rest of the world his divinity. Through his words and his actions, Jesus demonstrates the presence and power of God's kingdom in his life while revealing himself as the Son of Man. Specifically in today's passage, verses 30 through 33, tell us a few facts about this baby. First, he is to be named Jesus. Fun fact about the name Jesus, Jesus is actually the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua which means Yahweh is help or salvation. So Jesus means salvation. The name of Jesus and the word salvation bring about expectations. They bring about expectations of life, liberty, pardon, sanctification, power, comfort, peace, triumph, and many more things. Second, we learn that Jesus this baby is to be the son of the Most High. Once again, reiterating that this Jesus is not to just be Mary and Joseph's son, fully human, but reiterating the divinity of Christ. Luke chapter 1 at verse 28, as well as Matthew's gospel, both quote Isaiah 7:14, where the prophet declares that the virgin shall birth a child and he shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with it's important to note that these names and taglines for Jesus, they're not just taglines, they're not just pomp and circumstance. We don't just say, Jesus is salvation, Jesus is the Son of the Most High for no reason. We declare them because these names and meanings are declarations of hope. The Gospel teaches that the Kingdom has already arrived with Jesus' birth, and we aren't waiting for the arrival of a King anymore. He is, in fact, here with us now. We aren't powerless on this earth, although at times we may feel that way. We do have power in the name of Jesus, in God with us, because the kingdom of God is already at hand. It has already arrived with the birth of Jesus. 
and that is what we get to celebrate during Advent. We celebrate the arrival, the inauguration of God's kingdom on earth through the birth of Jesus. And the hope of the season really is in Jesus' presence with us while we wait. While we wait for the day of no more pain, no more suffering, the day of full restoration where only goodness and wholeness abound for the glory of God. That is what we wait on, and that is what we celebrate during Advent. So the Christmas story tells us what we can expect. God to be Emmanuel, God with us, whose promised eternal kingdom is already here. And now that we have these promises, what are we supposed to do with them? What are we supposed to do with these expectations? And I think many of us would identify with this next part of the passage where Mary questions what is happening in her life. Luke 34 through 38 says, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is also called Barry for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. Well, Luke doesn't give us too much to go off of here other than Mary's question of how will this be? I'm a virgin. Gabriel, I don't know if you know much about science or logic, but things aren't adding up here, okay? There are so many questions that I'm sure Mary did have and could have had about her situation. How is it possible I'm in a precarious situation, you know, I could get stoned, I could get killed for this, okay? This isn't a small high, a stork's dropping off a baby on your doorstep, okay? This is serious stuff. And I'm sure at this point, if I was Mary, I would be spiraling, okay? Who am I even supposed to be able to confide in about this? People are going to think I'm crazy. Who is going to believe me and not stone me as soon as I tell them this, okay? Who can I trust? But scripture doesn't focus on a spiraling Mary here, whether she was or wasn't in reality. Instead, scripture focuses on the omnipotence and the omnipresence of God. Verse 36 says, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And 37 says, with God, nothing is impossible. Emmanuel is the promise of God with us and the promise that nothing is impossible when he is with us. Scholar Joseph Exel identifies with Mary's doubt, saying, it would seem as if every soul had to undergo a period of questioning and doubt and wondering before it realizes the ineffable peace and cloudless radiance of perfect trust. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to question the promise of God. Having hope isn't a lack of either of those things. It's actually holding the questions and the doubt while anticipating the promises of God. It's not an either or, but it's a both and. Mary wasn't given a 10-step instruction on how to cope with this massive life change. She wasn't given a 10-step instruction on how to do this well, in fact. She was given the instruction to not fear, because God was with her. And in Mary's moment of questioning, the angel reassured her of the promise of God's presence. And he also reassured her that her relative Elizabeth was going through something supernatural as well. And I love this because God not only gives the promise and gift of his presence, but he also gave the gift of Elizabeth's presence. Time and time again, we're shown in scripture that we are not made to live alone, but we are made to live in community. And time and time again, in scripture and in our lives, God provides us the people that we need in the moment that we need them. 
Mary needed the encouragement of God's ability to do the impossible, not just in her life, but in somebody else's. Elizabeth might have birthed the one who would declare King Jesus, but she also bore the encouragement of the one who would birth the coming king. Don't underestimate the power of your testimony. Don't underestimate the value of sharing that dream with someone, of sharing your pain with someone, because you never know who God is encouraging and raising up in the shadow of your testimony. Don't underestimate. Emmanuel is the promise of God with us and the promise that nothing is impossible with him. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? Do you really believe that? Because sometimes I fear in my life gets so wrapped up with will God that I forget to even ponder could God. And if we do in fact believe that God could do the miraculous, to do the impossible, the question isn't will he, the question is really will we? Will you say yes? like Mary did? Will we hold our questions with the anticipation of the promise of Emmanuel? Will we face our questions, pain, even our joy and uncertainty by choosing to surrender like Mary and in ver like she said in verse 38, say, let it be to me according to your word. It's easy to read the story of Mary and think she had to have known that this was going to end up in a book somewhere. That she was the chosen one and it was this grand miracle. But when we read the story from Luke's perspective, he tells it in what scholar Bach calls a from earth up perspective. Meaning that we walk through Luke's gospel one step at a time revealing who Jesus is, just like those in real life experienced the revelation of Jesus. In John's gospel, we start the story captivated by the divinity of Christ. He is God. He is the Son of God. We are fully aware of his divinity when we read John. We approach Jesus with a full reverence and clear understanding of who he is as the divine and permanent messianic king promised in the Old Testament. But in Luke, we see the divine birth, we see this virgin birth, but we also are captured by the quiet servant mother living an ordinary life, faithful to her king while on earth. Choosing, we see God choosing to interact with a faithful servant and to partner with Mary to bring about the messianic promise in a way that no one expected. And isn't this how we experience God? Isn't this how we encounter Jesus one moment at a time? Some of us in this room may have had the 180 experience, the radical salvation, but for many of us, and even those who have had that radical salvation, we're learning to love and follow Jesus one ordinary moment at a time. One faithful step of obedience, one fear-filled, uncertain moment of surrender to trust in Jesus. Mary was humble. She was faithful, submissive, and quick to listen. Characteristics that we are all called to possess as followers of Christ. And it can be easy to look at Mary and start a comparison game. It can be easy to look at other people's Instagrams and say, man, they've got this whole Christ-likeness down. It's easy to chase so diligently towards these characteristics that we begin to idolize them. But scholar Derek Bach says this, Luke wants us to identify with Mary, not to unduly worship her. Let's not get caught up in the comparison game. Let's not idolize someone else's ability or seemingly perfect example of Christ-likeness. Instead, let's spur each other on. 
Let's be encouraged to the point of actual imitation of a life of consecration to Christ. In The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer states this. He says, the Christian is not to be a pious soul who waits for the kingdom of God. But the Christian is a man who, en who engages in active obedience to the will of God in the present world, preparing the way for Christ's coming by living faithfully according to his word. In order to live in this active obedience, we must echo Mary's words. Let it be to me according to your word. With these words, Mary laid herself upon the altar of God in an absolute abandonment to God's will, that he would do in and through her whatever pleased him. And such a call requires not just a negative denial of the world, but a positive consecration, dedication to God. And that requires decision, a resolute decision, followed by perseverance. And such perseverance must be entered into with a self-surrender manner, which can only result in a deep love and relationship with God. Worship team, if you would join me. This deep personal love reminds me of a story about one man's desire for a life of consecration to God. This story is about a man named Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. I say that five times fast. He's a German philosopher and a playwright, and he was very popular in the Enlightenment era. And it's said that Gotthold one day was shown a lock. Now this lock was constructed of rings that had inscribed on each ring a certain letter. And if the rings were turned a certain way, the letters could be represented to say the name Jesus. And it was only when the rings were turned to reflect the name Jesus that the lock could be opened. This invention pleased Gotthold so much that he exclaimed, oh, that I could put this lock upon my heart. It's a simple story. But as I read it, I reflected and I asked myself, is Jesus the key to, lock, to the lock upon my heart? Is the promise of Emmanuel sufficient for me? Or do I need other things? to hold my heart together. I long to be like Mary, to look at the impossible and say, let it be as you have said. I long to be like Gotthold with a lock of Jesus on my heart. I long to live a life that hopes in Jesus and says that Jesus Emmanuel is enough for me. And as we wait for the day when God's kingdom restores all things, may we take refuge in the promise of Emmanuel. Before we head into the ha happiest time of the year, which can also be said to be the loneliest, let us reflect on Emmanuel. We're going to spend some time today with our Savior. And as we end, your eyes. Imagine yourself as the lead character. And I want you to come. 